Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, another uh, FRCS Mentor Group uh, presentation. We are going to be uh, giving a talk by uh, Nikki Walsh, who works in Royal Lancaster Infirmary. She's going to present the topic on uh, surveillance in cerebral hip surveillance in cerebral palsy. Just a reminder, the mentors are going to do Viva sessions afterwards. Uh, these, this will not be recorded um, for the sake of privacy for the participants. Uh, we have a good showing from the mentors, including Nikki Walsh, Abdullah Hanoun, Anwar Kiani, and uh, Kashif uh, Mamoun. Um, so we look forward to a very lively uh, Viva session at the end. Uh, hi, Nikki, thank you very much. Uh, if you don't mind, Chris, at the beginning. Sure. Thank you for introducing me. Um, today I'm going to talk about hip surveillance in children with cerebral palsy. Um, the topic I'm about to do, it's the work, the views are all my own um, and I've put a link to some references as well. Um, so these are the references that I used. Um, the first one is a good review article by um, Jaios from last year and the cerebral palsy integrated pathway for Scotland at the bottom that's actually quite a good document which is available online um, and it runs through all examinations in cerebral palsy children um, which I think would be quite useful for the exam. So the definition of cerebral palsy is that it's actually a non-progressive um, brain lesion but the associated musculoskeletal pathology is progressive and typically results in um, spasticity and contractures of the muscle tendon units. Um, you also get bony torsional deformity due to the abnormal forces and eventually this gives rise to joint instability. So the point about cerebral palsy hips um, is that the, the, the hip joint itself is often normal at birth and therefore um, what happens as the children grow is that they then develop these contractures and deformities. So if we can intervene at an early stage, we can probably prevent a lot of the hip dislocations. So the goals of a surveillance program are to identify these children who, the children who are at risk of hip displacement and monitor their development over time and offer early appropriate intervention. So what happens? Well, the first thing is that you get abnormal muscle forces across the hip joint. You've got increased activity of the adductors, the hip flexors and the hamstrings, which gradually cause the proximal femur to migrate laterally and superiorly. Um, now, because the acetabulum development is dependent on a located femoral head, you can often get secondary acetabular changes and most typically it's a saucer shaped deformity in a cranolateral direction and then as the hip continues to displace um, it's then subjected to some abnormal forces and remodeling so um, you get an increase of the next shaft angle you get increased antiversion and you get flattening of the femoral head and um, due to pressure from the hip capsule and the abductors as the hip slides out laterally um, you can also get this groove on the superior part of the head, which is from the reflected uh, rectus femoris. So what's the relevance of this? Um, so if you've got a child that's an ambulatory child, you want to try and preserve um, that function as far as possible. And if you can locate the hip, then you're giving them a stable platform to allow them to weight bear um, and hopefully maintain their mobility. The other, the long-term outcome of a uh, cerebral palsy hip is that they will usually develop early osteoarthritis, which causes pain. Um, and if you can locate the hip at an early stage, then you can reduce the risk of this happening. In the non-ambulatory children, then you wanna give them a stable platform if they can transfer. Um, you need to maintain some kind of hip abduction in order for perineal hygiene because a lot of these children end up with flexed adducted hips and it can be quite difficult um, to keep up with their perineal hygiene. 
the hip subluxation dislocation leads to a pelvic obliquity which uh, when they're sitting in their wheelchairs <clears throat> causes a problem with sitting balance and tolerance um, and the pelvic oblique obliquity that develops may in turn worsen the scoliosis and all the inherent risks um, associated with that so when these children are sitting in their wheelchair ideally you want to keep them um, as balanced as you can um, to reduce the risk of these things happening and as well as pressure sores. Um, now some people would argue that maybe these hip dislocations are not painful but there is some evidence that they can be painful particularly in the elder, more elder um, CP child. So hip surveillance. Um, now the GMFCS um, scale is what's going to predict the like uh, the likelihood of your hip dislocating and I think whenever you approach a, ce a cerebral palsy child in an exam the first thing you want to do is work out what is their GMFCS score um, now that's a chart there as you can see one is usually ambulatory five is usually um, wheelchair bound with poor head control um, and this is available on the internet and I'd suggest that you get yourself a little bit familiar with it so that you can recognize it should you be paced with this kind of child in the exam. Um, now in the UK we don't have a definitive screening program um, as they do in Australia and um, Sweden. I think the Americans are trying to design one um, the one that Alder Hay uses is this CPIPS, which is based um, on a Scottish model. It's a group of physiotherapists that do all the initial assessments and then refer to an orthopedic surgeon um, as and when needed. And the common thing with all these surveillance programs is, is that you do a clinical examination and an AP pelvis. The clinical examination is not always reliable um, in these patients at detecting when the hips are dislocated or the ones that are at risk of progression but the AP pelvis is important to look at the migration percentage which we're going to come on to shortly. So this is what happens in the Scottish model which I understand is what we use in Alderhey. So you have a child with a diagnosis of cerebral palsy and you confirm what their GMFCS level is. Then you talk to the family um, about the program, which we're going to come on to in shortly, um, and the x-ray kind of protocol. Um, usually we start screening around about two years old, that's when most of the diagnoses are made, um, but obviously if they're not diagnosed till later, then they can just enter into the program at whatever stage they're at. So <clears throat> one of the first things you want to do is the Thomas test. Um, so this is from the CPAP, CPIPS website um, and essentially you just want to measure how much of a flexion contracture they've got initially. The next stage is to look at their hip abduction um, and again, we measure the angles of that. Often if they're, if they're hemiplegic, they might have one hip that's worse than the other, but you want to measure both sides so you can compare them and you want to see what happens to that over time. Internal and external rotation of the hip. So it, they break it up, it's slightly different. So the GMF CS one to three, you do it the way we would standard, uh, standardly look at an adult assessing their internal and external rotation and measure the angles. Um, and in the patients that are a four and five, you start in a slightly different position um, and again measure their rotation. And it's something that you're going to monitor with each session. Um, leg length, so leg length down the bottom here, standard. We're bearing in mind they're going to have flexion and adduction contractures that you'll need to take into account when you're looking at leg length. Um, the other test you can do is a Duncan Eli test looking for tightness of the rectus femoris um, and these kind of tests become important when you're thinking about soft tissue releases or botulism toxin um, and again hip extension. So this is the um, protocol 
um, for x-rays according to the CPIPS guidelines. And you'll see that the GMF CS ones and twos um, in this model, uh, we're gonna x-ray them at two, and we're gonna x-ray them at six, and we're gonna x-ray them at skeletal maturity. When you're getting into the three, fours and fives, we're usually gonna do it once a year or twice a year. Um, and we're gonna be looking at the migration percentage. So the important thing that your x-ray department needs to know is that because these children have got flexion deformities and um, a lordotic lumbar spine, then they need to modify um, the positioning when they take the x-rays, otherwise your measurements will be incorrect. So I'm gonna talk about this again in a second, but the main thing is this migration percentage index. And the way that you look for it is you identify Hilgenreiner's line and Perkins line, and then you're looking for the percentage of the ossified femoral head that's lateral to Perkins line. Um, so you measure the whole width of the epiphysis here, and then you measure the degree that's lateral to Perkins line, divide one by the other and multiply it by 100, and that will give you a migration percentage. The other thing that you can measure is the head shaft angle. Um, obviously the more valgus the hips are, the more likely they are to um, dislocate. So this is the migration percentage, and it's a measure of the femoral head containment within the acetabulum on the coronal plane. And this is why it's important that your x-ray is correct, so you don't get these measurements wrong. The Rymus migration percentage is the most accepted and reproducible measurement and all the surveillance systems use the migration percentage in determining um, follow-up and management of um, cerebral palsy hips. Um, and as I said before, it's a percentage of the ossified femoral head which is lateral to Perkins line and that's just a larger picture. You can also look at the acetabular index, um, but the main thing that I want you to take away from this talk is the importance of the migration percentage and how to work it out. So if we look at migration percentages, um, migration percentage of 10 is normal. Um, migration percentage of between 30 and 33, we would describe that type of hip as displaced, and a migration percentage of 90 to 100% we describe as dislocated. Now some hips with a migration percentage of less than 40% do not progress, but almost all of them with a migration percentage of 40% or more will progress to dislocation. And the most common age for picking this up is usually a child around the age of three or four with a migration percentage of more than 33%. The amount of displacement is strongly correlated to the CP subtype. Um, so somebody with a GMFCS of one would be considered to be low or negligible risk of developing um, hip dislocation. However, if you look at two, it's 15, three is 40, four is 70, and GMFCS five has got a 90% chance of um, developing a sublux of dislocated hips. Um, and then there is this subtype, type four hemiplegia, um, where they, because of their spasticity, um, they are at risk of developing um, a dislocated hip as well. So that's one category that you would follow up maybe as strongly as the GMFCS fives. So the CPIP system use this traffic light system, and I guess, you need to be aware of it, but we're really only going to see the red ones. So in Scotland, the physiotherapists see most of these patients and they do their examination here. Um, and then depending on what their examinations are and what the MP is on the x-rays. So if they fall into the red category, they're going to be referred to an orthopedic surgeon, whereas green, they're probably going to send to the physiotherapist unless they enter into the AMBA stage. So this is the Australian protocol, um, and I use this as an example as to how a surveillance system works. So for the GMFCS1, we're gonna do an X-ray when they're three and an X-ray when, when they're five. And we're not expecting them to progress. For a two, um, we do it once a year until the migration percentage is stable. Then we'll do one at five, and then we'll do one at eight. For the threes and fours, probably twice a year until they're age seven. And then if their migration percentage at that stage is less than 30%, we discontinue 
x-raying until they reach skeletal maturity. Uh, we discontinue x-raying until puberty, and then we x-ray them until skeletal maturity. For the fives, we're going to x-ray them twice a year um, until they're oops, until they're seven, and then we're going to do them um, annual until they reach skeletal maturity because these are the ones that are going to progress. So how are we going to manage it? Well, the initial management is non-operative, and I'd suggest that all patients with cerebral palsy to some extent should um, have things like positioning to avoid this prolonged adduction and flexion um, position. Bracing has been used, but it's not thought to be effective. <clears throat> Botulism toxin A, intrathecal baclofen, and selective dorsal rhizotomy. Uh, and all of these things, they might reduce the spasticity, but they're not actually proven to reduce the risk of hip dysplasia. So what are the operative options? Well, the first thing that you can do is soft tissue release. So release the adductors. Um, you can also release the iliopsoas um, and sometimes the rectus femoris if that's tight. There's, I think there's some evidence in the literature that there was some suggestion in the literature that iliopsoas caught, release of iliopsoas causes some flexion weakness, but it's not actually been proven to do that. And there's papers out there that say it's a reasonable um, option. We normally do them bilaterally um, to avoid the um, contralateral hip taking over the adducted position. Provided your acetabulum is not deformed, you can consider a varus derotation osteotomy. Um, and if your acetabulum is deformed, then you can consider Pemberton Dega or PAO. And you can combine an acetabular osteotomy with a uh, varus derotation osteotomy or with a shortening osteotomy of the femur um, in order to get the hip located. Salvage procedures, um, so when you're, you've got osteoarthritis or when it's truly dislocated and you can't reduce it, then there's this Castle and Scheider procedure which they resect proximal femur and interpose gluteus medius as a cap over the end of it, it's supposed to reduce pain. Um, total hip replacement is an option and hip arthrodesis. So in conclusion, we can reduce the risk of hip dislocation in these patients with a surveillance program. It's based on clinical and radiological examination. Um, the important things to consider are the child's age, the migration percentage, and their GMFCS level. Non-operative prevention should be offered to all children, and with an MP of more than 33%, consider operative intervention. Follow them up until skeletal maturity. And that's it. Has anyone got any questions? Um, if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to unmute your mic and ask or uh, type it into the, in the chat box and we'll read it out. Um, thank you, Nikki. Uh, that's a very good presentation. Um, can I ask you a couple of really mm -hmm. kind of basic questions, uh, just for completion? Um, the non-operative options, they include uh, stretching and is there any orthotics or uh, any supplementation to chairs and sleeping habits? Um, so yes, they do say stretching. Um, they say that bracing doesn't work. Um, but I think it's reasonable when you take care with positioning. So try and keep the legs, the hips abducted to some extent um, and with their general peritoneal, um, peritoneal toileting and stuff like that. I think they all benefit from some stretching, some physiotherapy. Um, but actual, I think we used to, when I was in Australia, sometimes we'd put them into a hip spiker, but it's not been shown, them and the Scottish right brace, They've not really been shown to reduce the chances of the hip dislocating um, and they can be quite cumbersome for the patients especially if they're a GMFCS5. So I don't think there's any option for bracing but certainly the stretching and the positioning and the pressure area care should be offered to all of them. Absolutely and also the uh, use of uh, cushioning and supplementation in the wheelchair can help patients yeah. with cerebral palsy such as an abduction cushion between the knees. Yeah. And from uh, John Amin, uh, for uh, migration percentage more than 66, what is the management? 
Um, I would say that would be, if the migration percentage is more than 66, then I think you'd be looking at operative management for that. Um, and it will depend on the child's age, the GMFCS score, whether the acetabulum is involved or not, what their clinical examination findings are, whether it's something that you could offer um, a various shortening femoral osteotomy, whether you need to include the acetabular osteotomy in it as well, I would think. But that would certainly be someone that I would think would benefit from operative surgery. Okay. And for complete dislocation? Again, it depends on the age of the child um, and their gym FCS. If you can get a located hip with a combination of um, femoral and acetabular osteotomy, I think that would be the way forward. If you can't, then you're looking at the salvage procedures, which again, depending on the child's age um, and their GMFCS, you know, possibly not suitable for a total hip, but it would depend on the child and the circumstances, but you could consider the Castle procedure or an arthrodesis. And for the, for the GMF5, uh, GMFCS5, 4 to 5, you can consider uh, excision arthroplasty as their yeah. own. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, any other questions? Oh, sorry, you know, I, I should clarify that you should consider uh, excision arthroplasty, not yeah. them. Um, any other questions? Okay, there's a couple of other comments I'd just like to make. Uh, if there's anything else the mentors would like to add? No. A um, couple of comments. In terms of cerebral palsy, uh, going down to the basic science, and I know it's very simple, but it's quite important because quite a few people seem to not grasp the concept of why cerebral palsy patients have flexor problems and adductor problems. And it's literally as simple as it's not that only the flexors and adductor, uh, adductors are tight, it's all muscle groups are tight in a cerebral palsy patient, especially the higher G GMFCSs. But the reason is the cross-sectional area or the lever arm of uh, each of those muscles outweigh the extensors and the abductors, abductors. So for example, in the hip, the psoas is a very thick, hot, big muscle. Uh, so it, it can flex much more powerfully than the extensors of the hip. And similarly for the adductors, the adductors have a long lever arm down, right down to the knee, while the abductors, though they are thick muscles, they are very short lever arm. And it's the, if you think about it, it's literally the explanation for the classical cerebral palsy positioning. So if you remember the classical cerebral palsy positioning, you can correlate very quickly as to which muscle groups are the problem in these patients. Um, also, the rationale behind why uh, valgus position of the hip deformities uh, and uh, acetabular deformity, as Nikki correctly pointed out, they are normal on birth, but they progressively get worse. The reason they do get worse is because of the constant dynamic spasming of the muscles which causes a forced valgus position on the hip uh, and also the proximal migration of the hip against the acetabulum causes a more vertical acetabulum and gradually causes a, um, a abnormal acetabular wear. So it can all be brought back to the basic science which is something I keep reminding everyone it's you can't get away from it in every part of your uh, station in the exam. Um, mentors, anything else to add? And any other questions? No, Nikki, seems you've answer, you've explained this perfectly well. Um, uh, they, they all understand it really well. And to be fair, I, I think it was a brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, participation list is uh, very good today considering we've just finished the exams, 26 uh, participants so far today. Uh, thank you so much Nikki, Nikki Walsh for uh, presenting uh, quite an important topic, um, cerebral palsy uh, surveillance, hip surveillance, which is not adequately covered in most places and I think it's an important question to uh, have prepared for the FRCS exam. Thank you very much. We'll stop recording now and proceed to the Viva section of our uh, session tonight.